Thank you, Professor. I'm very happy to be here with you, Excellencies and dear colleagues and friends. Democracy is a very fragile political system, constantly confronting multiple risks. One of them is propaganda. And as a case study, I choose to focus on propaganda at war which puts under test the resilience of democracy as well as all humanitarian principles. As old as the world itself, propaganda in war has always been about securing the consent of public opinion. The staffs of the opposing sides prepare and execute their communication strategy as carefully as they do with their operations at the battlefield. In the war of propaganda, all means are used. Articles and war reports in the media, films and documentaries, paintings and sculptures, posters, cartoons. The general title of this speech is Propaganda in War, but in which war? The fair or the unfair? And which is the fair war? Fair war, fair wars for us are the of offensive wars. In fair wars, propaganda and censorship are used to keep any and any and civilian morale high and stop information from reaching the enemy. In unfair wars, which means in aggressive wars, the purpose of propaganda is to impose the so-called non-dominant view in order to justify the war and hide its real causes which are never humanitarian. It was no coincidence that uh, at the time of the First World, the First World War, the American congressman Hiram Johnson had uttered the famous phrase Truth is the first victim of war. It was from this phrase that the famous journalist Philip Knightley borrowed the title of his book that would then become the Bible of war correspondence, the first victim. According to Knightley, there are two types of war-related news, referring to the war events themselves and to those that justify the um, war events. Every time, at the beginning of every war, fair or unfair, the war of, of information also begins. The struggle of censorship, a conflict in the conflict. Truth has always been the greater loser in wars, from the Crimea War to World Wars First and Second, Vietnam to Afghanistan, Yugoslavia to the First, Second and Third Gulf Wars, but also to all the hundreds of wars that broke out in all corners of the world, including the most recent invasion of Russia in Ukraine. Winston Churchill once said, in times of war, the truth is something so valuable that you need to protect it under many pillows of lies. The Krill Committee was in charge of propaganda and censorship in the United States during the Second World War, the First World War, sorry. Its goal was to spread news that supported the war effort and to obliterate any reports that even suggested a shadow of doubt. A prominent member of the commission was Edward Bernays, nephew of Sigmund Freud, the father of public relations, whose admirer was the Minister of Propaganda and Public Enlightenment of Nazi Germany, Joseph Goebbels. In Second World War, President Roosevelt decided for the first time to separate propaganda from censorship. The propaganda sector was taken over by the Facts and Statistics Service, later renamed the War Information Service. Its budget in the first year of the war alone was $40 million, and it was headed by the writer, analyst, and former New York Times journalist, Elmer Davis. 
The head of the censorship service was Byron Price, former editor-in-chief of the news agency's agency Associated Press. Millions of letters were read, telegrams were examined, phone calls were logged, and movies were censored in its offices. The service was also in charge of ensuring that newspapers and radio stations adhered to the code of military ethics. In theory, the mission of the censorship service was to prevent information that would endanger the allied cause from being passed to the enemy. In practice, it also dealt with issues related to the morale of the public opinion, cutting out everything that could lead thinking towards to the bad sides of the war, defeatism, criticism of important decisions of the political and military leadership. Hollywood was under the command of the War Information Service, which gave producers instructions on the subjects of the films they were making. That was when what was later called censorship at the source was imposed for the first time at that time. Journalists had to be excluded from any information that the military did not want to be known. The criterion was, is it good for the army for this sort of information to be known? At that time, journalists were completely identified with the war effort, to the point that after the end of the war, a journalist complained about not having someone to submit his text for the, for the approval. The great writer John Steinbeck, a war correspondent at that time, wrote, we all became part of the war effort. We followed it and embraced it. Gradually, it became part of us that the truth should automatically be kept secret. By that, I don't mean that we were lying, but we were only written about one side of the war. At that time, we passionately believed that this was the best thing to do. Journalists were treated as just another part of the military units. The way in which the Normandy invasion was covered is characteristic. The journalists at the time were loaded onto a train in Scotland a month earlier and held there for a week. When the business started, everything was set up perfectly. 558 journalists, photographers and cameramen were checked. There were sensors on the ships and on the beaches. Radio secrets were limited, but there were special planes and speedboats carrying information to London, and Eisenhower himself regularly briefed four correspondents of his own choosing. On the first day, the correspondents sent a total of 700,000 words. But years later, it was found that their reports had produ produced nothing substantive. At the time, censorship prevented a shocking report from being broadcast. General de Gaulle was touring the French countryside, accompanied by a group of journalists. He was speaking to the assembled crowd when a poor peasant woman appeared in front of him. She dragged her step, and along with it, she dragged a cart. She was carrying her dead child inside. As was revealed much later, the Allies had dropped leaflets to warn the population of the impending bombing. But at that time, strong winds were blowing in the area taking the leaflets away, something that the campaigners had not foreseen. The journalists accompanying General de Gaulle were not allowed to broadcast the image of the poor farmer. And there were many incidents that were concealed and revealed what it meant to advance with the Allies in that summer of 1944. During the Second War, Public opinion in, opinion in all countries that took part in the fight against Nazis was overprotected, and it was right. And that's perhaps why, years later, there was such a shock 
with the publication of books like The Naked and the Dead by Norman Mailer, who took part in the war and became famous because of that book. Decades after the end of the war, many truths began to come to light. Like Clint Eastwood's film Flags of Our Ancestors, when the famous actor and director demystified the legend around the photographer Joe Rosenthal's iconic image of soldiers raising the American flag on Mount Suribachi at Iwo Jima. It was then revealed that the incident took place, but under less difficult and dangerous circumstances. During the, World War, the Second World War, Walt Disney's popular cartoons, Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse, served a purpose other than entertainment. The heroes were recruited for the war effort, and the most famous duck in the world starred in series of films such as Donald Gets uh, Drafted, The Spirit of 1943, Commando Donald. Occasionally, the ministries of defense have released special brochures on managing the journalists. The first ones were released during the Vietnam War. They include instructions to military personnel in contact with journalists. Always look open, transparent and cooperative. Never attempt summary of suppression or direct control. Prefer to downplay rather than hide unwanted news. Control the emphasis with which the news is presented, not the news itself. Offset the bad news with good news. Even if you know the consequences of your mistakes, delay announcements by pretending that an investigation is underway until public interest is dampened. Lies are only allowed when it is certain that they will not be revealed, revealed during the war. This is nothing new. The Romans presented the conquered people as man-eaters. The Crusades were presented as necessary to stop Saracens, evil creatures, from dominating the tomb of Jesus. Saint Augustine, the first ideolo ideologist of fair war, argued as early as the fourth century that nowhere should be, it be inferred that war is fought for revenge, desire of domination, and other base instincts. In the war in Yugoslavia, three great communication weapons emerged, the smart bombs and the surgical attacks, which were included the alternative in the alternative information, but also the collateral consequences. One general said, we were aware of the effects of our mistakes, but we said that we were investigated and that there were many cases. We did not reveal the truth until a fortnight later when public interest had dimmed. Far from being a coincidence, although a record of a uh, number of 2,700 uh, journalists were accredited to the Kosovo War, the, Bri the British historian Alastair Horn argued that Kosovo ended up being the most secret military campaign in living memory. As you can see, the line is straight and comes from far away. Don't let the truth kill a good story, said the late 19th century yellow editor, Rudolf Hirst. We are engaged in a war we never wanted, proclaimed Adolf Hitler. Our soldiers are fighting in defense of the nation, art and spirit, Goebbels asserted. After 80 years, we are again threatened by German tanks, Putin says today. The Vietnam War was not lost in the battles, in the battlefields, but in the living rooms of the American homes, Marshal McLuhan had declared. The war is over, the journalists who have been defeated, a senior officer announced after the end of the first Gulf War. At the end of the last century, at the time when American-Spanish War was being prepared, and when American public opinion had to be prepared for the sending of troops to Cuba, the yellow publisher, William Randolph Hearst, 
sent the painter, the painter Remington, well famous painter Remington, to the island to post sketches of the war. After a few days in Cuba, Remington sent the following telegram to his employer. Everything is quiet here. There will be no war. Please allow me to return home, Remington, to immediately get the answer. Please stay. You will supply the images and I will supply the war, Hearst. And this time, the propaganda campaign was summed up in the famous phrase, phrase, don't tell them anything. At the end, tell them who won. This is how the great Spanish painter Goya fell victim to the need to keep the atrocities of the war secret. During the Fran Franco-Spanish War in 1808-1814, um, as a war correspondent, Goya, he captured the severity of the war with the executions of the insurgents, tortures, recaptures, orphanhood, and looting on both sides. These 83 sketches were eventually turned into prints and finally exhibited at the end of the um, um, 20th century in Prado under the general title, The Disasters of the War. In one of them, underneath the gruesome sheen, there is a note, Yolo V, I saw this. And in the next, and that too. And another shows a woman lying on, lying on the ground with all masters of war circling around her. The truth is dead writes Goya, and in the next sketch, he wonders, will ever be resurrected? The artist, who, is, uh, who in some of these sketches denounced the Inquisition's ignorance and obscurantism as a monster of ignorance, would have recognized the answer in his own skin. During his lifetime, these works of Goya never saw the light of day. Neither side released them for publication. And his famous painting, the 3rd of May in 1808, the most important anti-war work of art, the forerunner of Picasso's Guernica, spent its first 40 years in the Prando warehouses. Whatever it took to blunt the memories of the horrors of that war. But Goya, undoubtedly, preserved those dramatic incidents in mind, bringing war's inevitable reality to the light. This was a great revolution if we consider that until the 17th century in war, art served ex exclusively the exploits of the protagonists of the warlords. In the 20th century, many artists found themselves in the trenches of the First and Second World Wars. In the first Great War, special departments were created with groups dealing with so-called visual propaganda with film and visual arts. In the second Great War, radio, cinema, photography, and the press brought the war into the homes of the citizens. The opposing sides created special art programs while the Navy collected lists of prohibited reading books and withdrew artwork from museums. In Britain, around 300 conscript artists took part in the effort, creating works of art to show their dedication to duty. In 1942, Life magazine collaborated with the US Army and organized a competition with works by artists who were in the heart of the war. 125 works were exhibited a year later at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. In the Vietnam War, the group Artists and Writers Protest organized the festival Angry Arts Against the War in Vietnam. More than 600 artists took part in exhibitions and theatrical and musical performances, poetry recitals, documentary and film screenings. More than 500 films have been made about the Vietnam War and over 3,500 3, novels have been published. Nowadays, Putin has ordered those documentaries from the Russian attack on Ukraine be shown in cinemas. And among the persons 
He has sanctioned are uh, he has sanctors, actors like Sean Penn and Ben Stiller. At the same time, Steven Seagal was in Donbass filming a pro-Russian documentary. Bono was giving a concert in the Kiev met metro. Gerard Depardieu and Mikhail Baryshnikov were declaring their opposition to the invasion, while Ukraine imposed severe rest restrictions on the works of Russian writers and musicians who had Russian citizenship after the collapse of the USSR in 1991. Meanwhile, more than a hundred Russian film people signed a joint letter in favor of the withdrawal of Russian troops from Ukraine. It is also known that German president, Mr. Steinmeier, withdrew his support from an exhibition at the Tretyakov Gallery in Moscow, while President Zelensky is sending messages to festivals such as San Remo, Cannes, Grammy Awards, and I believe in Berlin Festival also. A few days ago, the bust of Stalin was unveiled in the Russian city of, of Volgograd in honor of the Battle of Stalingrad, with artist Sergei Serbakov admitting that everything was done quickly, the order had to be executed in a short time. Erdogan, the president of Turkey, completes the picture by taking advantage of migrants and refugees and converting the world-renowned cultural heritage monument Hagia Sophia into a mosque. May Allah grant us that Hagia Sophia remains a mosque until the day of revelation, said Ali Erbas, the Diyanets, the Turkish Religious Affairs Agency, had during the first Islamic prayer at the Hagia Sophia. Erdogan's Turkey and Putin's Russia are both revisionist powers that, in, that intend on resurrecting old empires, Russia, the Tsarist or the Soviet Empire, Turkey, the Ottoman Empire. And they put artistic creation at the service of their own ambitions. However, there are times when life changes plan and writes the best scenarios. Before the devastating earthquake in Turkey and Syria, President Erdogan used to threaten Greece with the phrase, we will come suddenly one night. After the earthquake, Turkish citizens wrote on social media, finally, the Greeks came suddenly one night to save us. Propaganda is like art. You don't have to respect the truth, Goebbels used to say. Finally, dear friends, let me use an example from ancient times to demonstrate how fragile our democracy becomes in the hands of despotic people. I'm coming from Greece, where democracy uh, was born. But I have to tell you that the Acropolis and Parthenon, these universal monuments of artistic creation, were built during the most glorious period of a flourishing democracy in ancient Athens. But 30 years later, Athens' democracy had collapsed. Thank you very much. Many thanks for this uh, very um, detailed and honest historical overview of uh, the practices and the rationale, so to speak, of propaganda up to the present day. One could even say this is a kind of uh, m ma manual of Machiavellian uh, politics. And one needs, of course, to know the truth. One has to m openly address these issues in order to uh, do anything about it. Otherwise, one uh, would be helpless. Uh, we have a few... Ma know the truth before the next war. Indeed. Ye yes, exactly. And uh, one should never accept, as you explained to us, this uh, view of uh, power that the truth must be kept secret. Unfortunately, those who rule 
today also in the European countries concerning the Ukraine war think that the truth must be kept secret. But that may be an issue later in this afternoon also. Please, if there is any uh, question at the moment, uh, let me just address one very um, particular issue which came up maybe in the last 30 years in the course of the first uh, war in the Gulf, namely that of embedded journalism. Is that not also a kind of uh, framework for propaganda? I mean, you have served, you have been journalist in war zones. Oh. Embedded yes. journalism means that the journalist is there with the full yes, you as part almost of the army. Or how do you see that? You, you know, when you are a correspondent, war correspondent, you have to swim in the lies. And you have to find out the truth. And you have to decide what you are going to publish. But let me tell you that uh, we have also the problem in other wars, let's say. Mm -hmm. For example, we have the problem uh, with the refugee issue. Uh, you know here in Germany that um, uh, for a long time uh, the, it was written in some newspapers that in Evros, in our border, in northern border, where there is a, a river, uh, which is the, the, the border between Greece and uh, Turkey, it was written that uh, a little girl was, uh, was uh, uh, b bitten by a scorpion on the island and that the girl died. And then the mother and father used to keep the girl in the water uh, until they find the tomb for her, but there was no water in the river at that time because it was, it was summer and there was no girl. And uh, then it was proved that uh, also there were no scorpions that could uh, send you to death uh, in that island. So, but th that was a story. And with this story, uh, Europe passed all summer until it was proved that all were lies and in Greece there were four children, the same four children that they were before coming in Greece and that this island doesn't have scorpions who lead you to die and that the river has no water because it is August. Uh, you know, wh what I want to say is that propaganda, it's easy to be spread around and then um, it is difficult. It's easy to say a lie, but it's difficult to take it back and say the truth. Thank you. Thank you. Example, we conclude that part Thank of the session.